And today I'm going to be talking to you about the environmental history of tigers in Singapore. This is a rather gory history that involves tigers killing numerous people in colonial Singapore before the island's human inhabitants hunted tigers to local extinction. I'm going to provide some explanations for why this occurred and talk about a lesson I think we can take away from this concerning our interactions with the environment. When I arrived in Singapore, I wanted to locate a local environmental history topic to research to help kind of submerse myself in my new home. And I, as I was looking for that topic, I was struck by cultural depictions of tigers in Singapore. There was tiger beer, tiger balm, tiger air. But so far as I knew, there were no real tigers in Singapore. Asking around, I learned that there once were, however. I wanted to know what happened to the tigers and why they were so significant to Singaporeans. Tigers may not have claimed a human life per day in Singapore, but concrete evidence exists for shocking numbers of fatalities. A summary of coroner's records at the notoriously violent settlement over a period of just months in 1855 recorded 13 verdicts of death by tiger as compared to five for willful murder and two for natural causes. So to put that in perspective, there were 13 people killed by tigers as compared to two dying from natural causes. In their official correspondences, straight settlement leaders lamented the frequent ravages of tigers, which the skeleton administration felt powerless to prevent. Finally, a perusal of Singapore's major English language newspapers between 1831 and 1890 reveals at least 159 confirmed fatal tiger attacks with authors consistently emphasizing that the overwhelming majority of cases went unreported because plantation owners were worried about their workers running off if these stories got out. We are thus left with a range of between just under 160 and several thousand fatal attacks in the 19th century with the actual number likely lying in the hundreds. The extreme poverty these individuals faced and the limited options for subsistence that resulted played a key role. Desperate for income of any kind, these pioneer agriculturalists easily fell into debt peonage to advanced merchant capital. They thereby became trapped in an environmentally destructive practice that placed both themselves and the island's tigers, as we shall see, in peril. Besides hiring themselves out to clear land, Malay and archipelagic Southeast Asian peasants also practiced small-scale slash-and-burn agriculture, propelling further deforestation in Singapore. Like Chinese coolies, Malay and island Southeast Asian laborers in Singapore took dangerous jobs felling the rainforest, largely because their imperial masters presented them with few better options. Engaged in forced labor, Indian convicts differed from their nominally free East Asian counterparts, but historical correlations between poverty and incarceration meant that in this instance too, Indigence, which is another word for poverty, helped trap these people in dangerous, often environmentally destructive work. We might therefore perceive these attacks as a straightforward tale of habitat loss, but the story is more complicated than that. Why, after all, would tigers that swam to the island not swim back to the relatively well-wooded Malay Peninsula uh, in response to deforestation. Indeed, as many 19th century observers wondered, why did tigers swim to Singapore at all when many of uh, Mal the Malayan Peninsula's forests remained in a so-called virgin state? An itinerant species, tigers likely swam to Singapore in pursuit of their prey, 
which included sambar, barking deer, and wild pig. But this does not explain why the cat stayed. Perhaps the answer is that gambier and pepper plantations were not such poor tiger habitat after all. Ecological studies have demonstrated that Malayan tigers actually reside in greater concentrations in selectively logged forests, where cleared areas and edge habitats allow for the growth of underbrush preferred by prey animals. Similarly, observers in 19th century Singapore noted that both deer and pigs clustered to the young shoots growing on the gambier plantations. Moreover, both gambier and pepper plants grow to substantial heights, providing ample concealment for tigers, which prefer to jump on their prey from cover. Supporting this interpretation, in 1902, amateur historian Charles Buckley wrote that, quote, it was when the gambier and pepper plantations began, began to extend beyond the town that tigers commenced to be so dangerous. Perhaps then, the problem was not so much habitat loss as the creation of new habitat that tigers found enticing, but in which they could no longer remain isolated from humans. Unable to maintain their normal strategy of avoiding people, some of the cats instead incorporated them into their diets. Those poor Chinese, Malay, archipelagic Southeast Asian, and Indian workers who ventured into the interior, a tiger luring ecotone where jungle met plantation, suffered the consequences of this new behavior. Chinese planters initially responded to the attacks by appealing to their British administrators for assistance. When the British offered little aid, save for the bounty, some Chinese elected to protect themselves by killing tigers. The combined influence of this hunting was devastating to Singapore's tiger population. Between 1830 and 1910, there had been 57 reported instances of humans killing, or more rarely, capturing tigers alive. So that's 57 instances, and many other cases may have gone unreported. Malayan tigers typically exist in densities of fewer than three per hundred square uh, kilometers. So on an island just over five times, which we would speculate would, would support 15 tigers, these were devastating losses. Popular legend in Singapore holds that a Briton shot the island's last tiger beneath the billiard table of the Raffles Hotel in 1902. Uh, in fact, this was an escaped domestic tiger, and it actually met, met its sad fate under the building's floorboards. In reality, a large multi-ethnic hunting expedition killed Singapore's last tiger in October of 1930 near Chua Chukang village, deep in the island's interior. In the end, Singapore's colonial subjects protected themselves from tigers when their British administrators proved incapable of doing so. In this colony, poor Chinese, Malays, archipelagic Southeast Asians, and Indian convicts struggled to eke out a living by destroying rainforest at the behest of government officials and financiers because these toiling people possessed no better options. Chinese coolies and Malay and island Southeast Asian workers relocated to the settlements to escape conditions of poverty. For their part, Indian convict laborers had no choice in the matter. They went because their British rulers sent them. These laborers were among the most vulnerable members of their society. In testament to their unenviable predicament, they ventured into the dangerous jungles of Singapore's interior a space Europeans seldom dared enter. As these workers struggled within the strictures of a market-oriented colonial economy to transform forests into farms, houses, and roads, they inadvertently created an ecology of poverty that had catastrophic consequences for humans and tigers alike. Finding ever less forest in which to hide from humans 
some of the mighty cats instead began to regard people as prey. Trapped in place by debt peonage and exploitative penal policies, and receiving little assistance from their colonial rulers, poor Chinese, Malays, archipelagic Southeast Asians, and Indians sought to protect themselves by killing tigers. In the end, the humans vanquished the cats, but not without enduring hundreds of fatalities. The environmental history of tigers in Singapore reminds us that those of us who care about the environment must remember that many of the people engaged in the work of destroying nature, the peasant slasher and burner of forest, the indigenous fisher of dwindling stocks, and even the impoverished poacher of endangered species, do so in part because prevailing economic and political conditions have left them with few better options. If we want to protect the environment, we need to assist and empower people. The world's tiger and the poor and marginalized people who most frequently interact with them both deserve compassion. <laughs>